Hi, this is your grinning gaucho. Yeah, whatever that means. Uh, this is Steve Gilmore. This is the Gilmore Gang. It's uh, Friday, and uh, we got people coming in from undisclosed locations. And we'll start with the furthest away, and that's in China, Keith Tier. Welcome, Keith. Thank you for having me. Look at this. This is the local beer. Yeah, Hainan beer. Really? Hey, ni ni hao. Ni hao. Xie xie. <laughs> and the and that voice is. Uh, in uh i don't know where he is but dan farber welcome dan it's nice to be here this afternoon where are you uh right now i'm near occidental california out in the county so to speak okay and from his uh landlined uh fortress of uh, um, yeah. <laughs> mutation <laughs> solitude <laughs> mutation <laughs> his fortress <laughs> of mutation john Tashek. Ineptitude, I am here. Thank you, Steve. It's great to be here. Yeah, well, I'm sure you're appreciating the intro. Um, Very much so. Okay, well, I'll do better next time. <laughs> I don't know what that means either. Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, Dan Farber. What uh, What's going on in your neck of the woods? Al. Al. Uh, well, right now, just trying to keep warm. That's That's the basic idea. And uh, other than that, you know, in the so-called technology world, it's, you know, we're, we're kind of zooming in on the year end. So there's a lot of people, at least in our shop, working on year end stories about what the year meant and what's the look ahead. Uh, in terms of news this week, it's been a bit sparse. I think we had talked a little bit about Instagram, uh, we, we're a case where Facebook couldn't buy Snapchat for $3 billion, so they just added uh, direct messaging to Instagram. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but uh, Twitter rolled out uh, yet another UI for uh, direct messages. Right, the more well, focus on direct messaging. So I think that, that, that it's becoming more the fact that if you have a messaging service, having an, you know, the Swiss Army knife of the various kinds of activities you can do is, is starting to make more sense, even though it might not be what users want. And actually, Twitter, Twitter added um, pictures to direct messages. So, so there's beginning to be uh, feature conversion. And uh, uh, I call it the, uh, the sharing spectrum. And it's really all about private and public uh, and whether you're anonymous or named. So you can be anonymous in private, Snapchat, uh, sorry, not Snapchat, uh, chat roulette. You can be uh, anonymous in public. Uh, which is what Twitter kind of lets you achieve if you want to, or you can be named in public, uh, which is what you'd want to say, Facebook or LinkedIn. But the spectrum is, you know, anonymous or named, private to public. And they, they start adding features where an app that begins maybe as a public anonymous app starts doing private named messages. Yeah, the only thing that's missing at this point is that they haven't adopted Snapchat's ephemeral messaging. Right. So that you can time out message. And I, I think I think it's just a matter of time. I think they're all a little bit like, well, we don't want to be copycats, but yet they really do. Well, it's that, and that's just a, that's a, such an easy feature to add to anyone. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, speaking as someone who has an app in the space, um, that, that is not, that's a, like a week's work. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if I agree with the framing. Do you, John Tashek? The framing of that anonymous to public, that, that yeah, framing? Yeah, exactly. Anonymous and named. So you can either be named or anonymous. And then depending on which of those two you are, uh, you can either be public or personal you know, with individuals or groups. Right. Well, I agree, ag agree with part of the framing, but not the anonymous to name. Uh, I think, I mean, how many people on this uh, show currently are running chat roulette? I rest my case. Uh John, what do you think? I think <laughs> I think chat roulette is uh I I was surprised that it's still around. I yeah. mean, after the guy played the piano for 24 hours straight or 36 hours straight, I I thought that it was end. It was over. Um anonymous anonymous is just part of human nature to be able to speak without any recourse and um 
you know, and I think that it's not regulated by any means, but even by, you know, checks and balances within peer groups. So I think it's always going to exist. I think at some point, you know, there's proof that anonymous people are ferreted out and made public. And I think the, the idealistic view is that uh, anonymous people eventually will just want to uh, become more public with their figures. But I, there's, no, there's no evidence that that's ever going to happen. I think they're very discreet things. Well, I think uh, obviously civil liberties, uh, the ACLU and others, uh, applaud the use of uh, anonymous uh, uh, you know, message bases and things like that. But I, I found limited value uh, from... Uh, the concept of anonymity. Obviously, we have whistleblowers and all sorts of reasons from a political and socioeconomic perspective uh, to uh, support, you know, freedom of the press, essentially. But just the quality of, uh, you know, basically people who are, who have the opportunity to hide behind some sort of a handle uh, usually end up abusing that uh Privilege. Well, you, you know, but I, I think we have to put things in context. You talk about framing things. I mean, the frame for social media is that um, it just mirrors human nature. Uh, the, you know, it's not like social media tools are creating some kind of new twist or altering the DNA of humans. No, it's, it's actually feeding into how humans behave and they take advantage of the tools in the same way they would in the analog world. It's just much easier, more pervasive, uh, global, and, you know, there's this new social fabric being woven. And part of that fabric is you can, just as Keith was saying, it has that, there's that, there's that span, you know, to be anonymous, to be known, to be unknown, um, to be direct message, to be public messaging, uh, to create fake ID. I mean, it's all just human nature. And I, yeah, I can it, tell it, I can tell you from just from experience, um, the we added um, anonymity as an option to a just me message about a month ago, and those messages are, are, are now dominating our public stream, uh, and they're funny, uh, they're kind of naughty on occasion. Um, they're text only, so there's there's no chat roulette element to them, um, and they're very engaged. And um, people kind of take when they when they're cloaked, you know, they they lose their inhibitions, um, and then little by little they come out from under their cloak and start doing things uh, using their name, using other message types. And I, I think the key here, and this this is something I thought was true for two years. The key here is that as an app, you have to support as many modes of human behavior as as humans want to use in, in as seamless a way as they want to use them. And I was always suspicious of single use case apps, which dominate. Uh, and I think what Twitter and Facebook, uh, sorry, Twitter and Instagram did in the last week is um, they extended the range of things that they can support in what the humans want to do. Well, I, I, I totally know. agree with that. Um, and John, you had something you were about to say? I was going to say human nature is to be uh, private. You know, as, a, as children, you're de definitely kind of, you know, private. There's uh, not a lot of public as aspects to your life. You know, you're protected in a lot of cases, not every case, but a lot of cases. And over time, you become more public. Um, and the same can be associated with um, how you communicate on the, on the Internet um, or through apps, uh, you know, such as Just.me. But I think that the amplification problem is changing how people communicate uh, to go along with kind of what da Dan said. I just think it's being used for the wrong purposes in a lot of cases. Hey, uh, hey John. Bullying and things like that. John, I, I was just thinking of an enterprise equivalent. I, I don't know if you do this in your all hands meetings, but I use, always used to have this uh, box where employees could put questions to the all hands meeting and they could be anonymous. And those were always a lot more successful than someone standing up, you know, in the middle of the all hands meeting and saying what they thought and you know being identified with it. It, it kind of helped get things out. So, so, you know, to some extent, I, um, I, al I also think, by the way, I think I even like it because, uh, and I think I can be a champion of it because the last 
probably 20 years since the AIDS panic, um, there's been a very growing kind of conservatism that parents have towards children. Uh, the fear of bad stuff, if you like, has dominated um, against, say, experimentation. And if you, you know, contrast, say, the 60s with, I don't know, uh, the early 2000s, you, you really see that. Uh, there's a book, great book called Paranoid Parenting that talks about it. And in, in a way, what the kids are doing is they are reacting against the regime. And anonymity is kind of a weapon in their armory. And they really are kind of out there. They're pretty naughty, um, and young as well, young and naughty, um, but not scarily so. You know, it's kind of all within the range of what we would have done at that age. Um, uh, so it's interesting to watch for me. You also you, you do hear about, uh, they might be uh, side cases, um, bullying that leads to suicides and things like yeah. that. I think those are, those, those are there. But I think you're right. I, I, I associate it with the milk carton, um, you know, the lost children on the milk carton, because that was during my era as a kid where we were, you know, we could run rampant all over the streets and we didn't do anything, you know. Well, anyway, the kids these days don't really run around the streets as much, you know, and, and it is because there's a lot of very concerned parents about no, they, that. They run around the virtual streets. Yeah, the, exactly. The behavior that I've seen, uh, at least with our kids, is that they, uh, their use of these private public uh, channels is dominant. I mean, that's all they do. Basically, we have to sort of extort them out of their room with offers of food and skateboards. But you know the <laughs> the the reality is is that not kidding. Uh, yeah, no, totally not kidding. Uh, but the reality is is that uh, I, the my objection to the framing around anonymous versus uh, public versus private is that. It, it, as I think you also said, Keith, they're both, tr you know, public and private is the real dominant thing. The, mm -hmm. the uh, ability for these networks to be able to provide equal weight between public and private is, I think, what the big change is here. I think people yeah. have gotten used to uh, Facebook, they've gotten used to Twitter, and now what they're looking for is the uh, ability to speak more frankly and more directly. And I think that's what's uh, going to cross over into the enterprise as well. Yeah, it's, I can tell you it's compelling viewing for me, um, even though it's moving uh, slowly uh, and I'm in China and watching it remotely, but it's compelling because I tried to launch an app with these in, uh, in April, and the feedback was it's too complicated. So I think the other thing they've done right, and I didn't do right, is they started with a simple use case, just one. Uh, and, and actually, different companies start in different places. Tw Twitter started in the, uh, I draw it as a quadrant, and I call it the upper right, which is an anonymous, that is to say, screen names, not real names, and uh, public. But, you know, Facebook starts in named and shared, or per personal, which is, which is the, the bottom uh, quadrant. And, uh, but they all end up spreading uh, in, into uh, at least three out of four possible quadrants. And um, I started with all four. It doesn't work. You've got to start with, with one, get big there, and then start adding them. Yeah, I mean, it may be that uh, 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 Snapchat uh, achieved critical mass with the uh, you know, anonymous, uh, completely private model. Uh, but, I mean, there's nothing anonymous about a phone uh, text because they've got your phone number. And if they've got their, you know, you're giving a cent to them spamming you uh, because they have access to your phone number. So it's uh, it's completely different than this anonymous chat yeah. kind of model that, that uh, has tormented, uh, I mean, TechCrunch, for example, I don't know what system they're using now, but it seems to have settled down. Uh, but there were in the heyday of TechCrunch comments. It was just a, you know, you know, it was a wasteland basically, and and it was also to John's point, it was also deeply disturbing, uh, yeah. Because uh, you know, people just once they get into their room, they can do anything they want, and when they add, when you add that in with public uh, sort of quorum, 
uh, you get a, a strange effect that uh, well, that what, isn't but all you uh, what you're really saying is that people are disturbing because because all that really absolutely. Happens, um, I, I'm not and, and suggesting it, that this is being incentivized by uh, this technology. I think that it's always been there, but you know that you have the uh, ability to be able to say things in a even just in a regular chat that you wouldn't normally say to someone's face because they might reach out and, and smack you in the face. I think it triggers yeah. a chemical change. I mean, it, I think it really does, it, that you c lose your inhibitions on these in these chat rooms. If you go to the SF gate, which allows free chat, um, free comments on uh, anything, and if you see something, and if you read the something about a car accident or somebody getting killed or a bicycle um, you know, rider who's being run over, just read those comments. That stuff just does not normally happen. If somebody might have the little thought and they, the checks and balances pushes that down into submission so that they have some rational behavior. But on those comments, they're not rational. They're irrational. And there's a swarm behavior and there's no checks and balances. And you just feel sorry for all those people who have been, you know, well, they, their families, the people have been killed or, the, you know, the people have been injured. It, it's really terrible. And I'm not yeah, saying that the world is just dystopian place like that. I mean, it's these are, it's not humanity. It's it enables parts of that to exist. Yeah. I, I, so I, I think you're right. But uh, what happens is the worst behavior gets imposed on everybody, basically. Um, uh, but having said that, um, you know that that kind of is a reflection of what's really there in society. And I don't think these apps. Someone in the chat room said these apps encourage. I don't think it encourages. I just think it provides the means of expression for what's already there. We've got this uh, 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 naked Nadine on just on me. And this, I think it creates uh, it. I absolutely mm. think it creates that ability to do that. It just. It's like there, there's probably some chemical changes. I don't think it's just like. Oh, it's just you and me doing this because we're not the ones doing it. I think it just frees them up to do it, and it just well, that's true, that's true. But but they have to have it within their personality to do it anyway. I, yeah, I, I mean, this is this is not any different than you're sitting in a bar with your friends and being snarky. Uh, you just get to broadcast it to a larger world and and you but know, there's have also an infinite amount of space to do it. Um, it certainly accelerates and amplifies that kind of behavior, but it's not like you can put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah, no, the, the thing to, about a bar is, is the thing about a bar is is that you know <laughs> uh, the combination of alcohol and physical proximity can be very seriously uh, damaging to your face and other things. <laughs> you know, I mean, these guys. I, I once walked into a bar and. Uh, with a friend of mine, I think I've told this story, and I was. I thought you was with a rabbi and a priest. No, that was two Jews and a rabbi. Oh, okay. <laughs> what? And uh, I was walking into this uh, nightclub in uh, in Woodstock, Joyous Lake, and uh, I was with a friend, and I was talking about. Um, here comes the to my friend. I said, "Hey, look! Here comes the hell Hell's Angels." It's two Hell's Angels were walking out. And the lead held this angel said, you're not invisible, asshole. You know, in other words, you know, it was a nice hell's angel or I would have gotten clocked right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, 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 I'm not so sure that there's a, uh, that there are rules of the road that people respect in these environments uh, for, well, they're, they're, for what well, constitutes I, I, appropriate behavior. I, I've been doing the work that Craig Newmark does or says he does on Craigslist, which is I, I'm the guy that has to deal with these people on just me. And uh, I can tell you I've got a method and it works 100% of the time. I, I send them a private message saying, uh, you know, this place has people as young as 12. It's not appropriate to behave like that in public. We do have private chat and private interaction. If you want to do that stuff, it's fine, but do it in private. 100% they stop. Well, I think what stops them mostly is that their content gets boring and people just tune out. That's true as well. So, speaking of being boring, <laughs> what else is going on? Uh, what else is going on? Yeah, why uh, are you in China, uh, Keith? Uh, you know, 
uh, amazingly, I'm actually famous in China because I invented Chinese language keywords when I did real names. So Chinese using their language as a navigation tool is, is attributed to me. And so I get invited here a lot to do talks. And uh, I was speaking in Guangzhou on the 7th, and I'm speaking there again on the uh, 18th. That's an 11-day gap. And it didn't, didn't seem worth flying back and forth twice. So uh, I am on uh, Hainan Island, which is like the Hawaii of China, in a Hilton resort, writing and um, plotting the future um, in a, in a, while swimming in between uh, writing attempts. Well, I, what I find fascinating is, is that with all the talk about them suppressing the communications uh, in and out, uh, I mean, we're doing this. Uh, they, they don't seem to be monitoring this. No, and I'm not, I'm not on a VPN, although I will say I do need to go on a VPN if I want to get uh, Twitter or Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I can get on Sina Weibo, or I, I've signed up for WeChat because everyone in China is on WeChat. It's actually amazing. You know, I went to a party, and um, I ran out of business cards, and people uh, s said, do you have WeChat? So I installed it, and it has a QR code in there. And literally, all you do is you hold your phone up with a QR code showing, and people scan it, and now you're on their WeChat. And uh, er I, I can guarantee everyone I met, that's how they get to know each other. They scan each other's QR codes on WeChat. It's, it's absolutely ubiquitous. Are there a lot of... Apple uh, iPhone 5Cs there, and we had the uh, Gilmore game where we talked about 5C meaning China. Or are you seeing a lot of Android? What are you seeing there? Um, well, um, it, it depends uh, who they are. Younger people who don't have a lot of money ha have uh, these big screen Androids. They, they go for the biggest screen they can get. Um, so it's typically a Samsung Note, um, uh, uh, five inch or more. Uh, but uh, the more money they have, the more likely they have an iPhone. And I've seen no Cs, funnily enough. I've only seen, uh, I don't know if they were Ss or they predate Cs because it's the same shape. And I didn't look closely enough to know if it was a, an S or, a, or a, one of the older ones. Uh, but lots of iPhones, uh, like at this resort, everyone has an iPhone because you would only come here if you can afford it. So it's a luxury brand of China also. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But regular people have Androids and um, just Samsungs mainly. Can you VPN out of China now? Or do they block all, the v all those free VPNs and tours and things like that that are out there? I could, I've been VPNing a lot. Uh, whenever I want to do something that's blocked, I, just, I've, I've, I pay for a UK VPN anyway because I want to watch BBC uh, back home. And that's how I pretend I'm in the UK. So um, I have a UK VPN, and I've been using that, and I, then I can get anything. And I've got two different ones. They both work. Please, no uh, Downton Abbey spoilers. <laughs> or Sherlock. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you, you've actually watched all those shows? I, did, I watched Downton Abbey because my wife loves it, and I kind of got in, into it through her. It wouldn't be my natural instinct to watch it. As an Englishman, you hate the English stuff. Apart from Doctor Who, the only thing I really love is Doctor Who. Dan Farber, you were in uh, the... Uh, uh, what, what country were you in recently? I was in Taiwan, yeah. which is not exactly China, uh, oh. unless you're from China. <laughs> <laughs> what was the, uh, what was the uh, percentage of uh, iPhones you saw there? I think that there's a lot more iPhones in uh, Taiwan, and I, I think, you know, with the China Mobile deal coming up, it's supposed to be un uncorked on December 18th. Uh, uh, that means that Apple has all three of the major China um, carriers, and you know, people are saying it's going to, you know, add another 15, 20 million phones sold uh, as when that gets unleashed. So. Uh, despite the fact that Apple, you know, hasn't really done much new this year, uh, despite the fact that Android now accounts for about 80% uh, worldwide of phones sold compared to Apple's, who's down around 12.9%, Apple still continues to do extraordinarily well. 
because their model is not about selling the most. It's about selling you know, a product where they can charge a premium and generate a lot of profit compared to anyone else and kind of maintain this idea that um, there can be uh, brands like a BMW or Mercedes that don't have to sell the most, but they have incredibly great business models. And um, China's, just, China's just going to add to that. Do you see Windows Dynamite. 8? Or, sorry, Keith, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I'm actually going to be at the China Mobile announcement on the 18th. It's in Guangzhou, where, I, where I'm going to be. And um, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but Apple's results came out yesterday, and their stock was up like $40 overnight, 7%, I think it was, overnight. Um, I don't know what it is now because I've only just woken up here. So I well, got, they're, but, they're selling strongly uh, on all four major U.S. carriers. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the, dominant. The, yeah, dominant. exactly. Do and, they and have? Think, uh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say to Dan's point. Um, if you look at the market from the point of view of what percentage of the profit dollars goes where, I think only Apple and Samsung are even in, on the list in a meaningful way. Um, and and, and uh, but Apple's way beyond Samsung in, pro in terms of essentially the profit taken from the mobile eco ecosystem. Well, to use a, a, another uh, uh, statistic, the uh, uh, people on Amazon without a Kindle uh, sell, you know, um, you buy a certain percentage, uh, you know, a certain amount. Eight, eight, eight hundred dollars, so eight hundred dollars a year versus twelve hundred if they have one. Exactly. So you know, clearly there's, uh, it's the ecosystem. I mean, I I don't have a fire, never will. But uh, I thought you bought one when it first came out. No, I I did not. I made um, fun of it. The new one looks pretty good. Um, I don't have it either. I have an old fire, which is like a brick now. But uh, but so if they count that from I don't know two more than two years ago, yeah, I spend more than twelve hundred you know a year on on Amazon. But well, I don't use that thing. <laughs> their their Kindle. I mean, Amazon Prime is an enormously successful uh, product. It's it's really quite incredible. Uh, we've been building the new studio, and so we've spent several months vacation on on Amazon in the last couple of days. But uh, the, uh, I mean, I just since uh, their Kindle program, uh, you know, the app on other devices, you know, I feel like I have a Kindle because I I use it in that way. I I go to Amazon constantly, so I think that. Uh, I don't know what the data is uh, that I don't know what the comparison would be with having a Kindle app on your other device, whether that's raising uh, your purchasing uh, above. But I would be willing to bet that it does. John, you were well, going to say a couple of things. Mm, well, I, was, I mean, I, my I, I'm sorry. I just wanted to go back to Apple for a second. Uh, Keith was saying that Apple's on a tear. They're actually down. Over a percent today, and you know the results don't come out until next next year. But I think everybody's projecting that you know this is going to be a great quarter for Apple, and it, you know it's a quarter in which you know they introduced some new products, a new iPad, new new iPhone, and you know they are not the most full featured, they're not the cleverest products, but you know it's really about Apple's total product experience, and I think that's what Apple is selling. It's a product experience. It's a brand, not to the, the the most uh, advanced uh, yeah well I, I agree with that screen, whatever. Yeah. On, on the tablet side I think that uh, you know it's interesting that you don't even mention uh, what I consider to be the most important product that they shipped uh, which is other than the 5S which is this uh, Air uh, yes I mentioned iPad iPad Air I thought you mentioned the phone and the mini but in any uh, case, I thought that they, uh, I don't think they fumbled the Mini. It's just that if you look at the Mini and then you look at the Air, it's not that much heavier and it's a lot bigger. And it's just, it, it's extraordinary with the same processor. So, you know, I think that the, you can say yeah, that they I mean, haven't improved, but uh, the, well, the experience with this improved. device is incredible compared to any other device. Uh, there, there's a lot of improvements. It's just the the, the improvements are more in the craft and in, 
and then you know saying oh well we've got a faster chip uh, but their camera is still not as as good as others their you know battery life hasn't improved that much uh you know the screen resolution isn't um as high as some others so but that's that's really not how they sell or how people buy these days it's uh uh, it's not a speeds and feeds buy. Well, they do have the uh, the processor and the coprocessor in there. I, I mean, there there's some speed thing in there, and it's speed versus the same battery life. Um, I I don't know. I think they are doing that. It's it's they're they're getting yeah, out I, of I that race though. They don't want to be in that race of features. I, I, I think I'm just saying that's not how people buy anymore. You don't go into the store and you say. Um, well, I want the one with the the you know M7 I processor, or you know I want the one with the Intel processor or the Haswell processor. They just go in and say, "I'm just buying Apple. Um, I don't care. I, I just know it's going to be fast. It's going to be reliable, and and uh, I know how to use the apps." And, and what does that say about apps. Intel? Uh, you know, Intel. There's a story today. I think you know, it's been out there for a while about Intel. Sorry, Google uh, shifting over their servers into non-Intel uh, architectures. There's uh, Intel not inside a lot of the tablets that are out there. Um, what do you think that's happening there? The Intel inside campaign is completely done now. Have they replaced it with anything? Well, uh, you know they're they're working hard. You know they tried to kind of establish a beachhead on TV, and they gave up on that with their new CEO. They, um, you know, invested a lot in competing with the ARM chip, with the, I think it's called their Atom chip. So, you know, they still want to play, but they're kind of like Microsoft in that. They kind of missed that part of the mobile revolution on the first round, and now they're playing catch-up, and um, it's not easy. Uh, and Google's saying, forget it. That's, that's the devastating part of it right now. Yeah, I think that's a negotiation plan, though. I, yeah. Don't you? I mean, it's uh, they spent... It's more than a billion dollars to create a fab, and there—I mean—the Haswell architecture is not. There's nothing comparable to it, as far as I can tell. Um, but there's there are different things emerging with low-cost energy on the server side. Uh, so maybe that's something that they're. In, I don't know. I don't know why they why Google would even say something like that. Why do you think? Unless it's to, for negotiation. Uh, they don't seem to or negotiate. Or maybe they want to be like Apple and build their own chips. Yeah, that sounds more like what is going on. License ARM and just build their own. Yeah, I don't. I, that's it's a, it's pretty expensive to build chips. Well, you know, there's you're a, not, there not, is, you're not building. You're outsourcing the build. You're just you know you know doing the the design on it. You know to your own specs and saving that on that end of it. But Apple doesn't manufacture. They they simply uh, build you know ARM to their spec, and they're not paying any licensing fee. I think it's pretty expensive to do that, though. I I, I don't know. I, I think so. Maybe they, they could license Samsung or you know some uh, chips for the devices. Yeah, I, I think it depends on your volumes, and Apple has the kind of volumes where it probably makes sense. Yeah, the last four devices that they've shipped have been on their own chipset, and uh, they've done phenomenally well. So. Uh, no, think- it, but this is not so. Google's still using. Uh, I mean, mostly Qualcomm, and I think that's fine. Um, they're talking about their servers in their in their cloud farms, replacing all of those with ARM. Yeah. And the re- the reason to do that is pretty obvious. Their electrical bill must be pretty expensive, <laughs> and they want to reduce that uh, without sacrificing you know the performance that they can get from all the you know servers that they power the cloud. Um, but it, that is also pretty expensive to go out and replace those. So, so that means that means there's a window of opportunity for somebody else to get in there. I think. I don't know. I'm not well, enough server expert to know, but I know that electrical costs will be, you know, a huge expense for them. Well, you, well if, if you... you're Google, you're thinking about 50 years from now. So, if you say, well, it's going to make sense for us to control our own destiny in terms of chips, or not be tied into a closed source kind of thing, then they can do that. Well, I, I guess you know what you were talking about, Apple, uh, that they don't really build it themselves. I don't think any of these major players are. Build, you know, in the mobile They're revolution. not building fads. They're not right. building fads. Yeah. So the question is: Is uh, do you think that Google is is trying to own this as a made in the USA kind of a model? Because I don't get that. 
Well, if they do that, that kind of screws over the rest of the world uh, sales. <laughs> I don't think they're going to do that. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think that uh, I, I don't know. I think that it's partnering with Qualcomm, partnering with anybody who's you know chipset vendors is really really good. They don't really want to get too tight with Samsung because you know Samsung is somewhat of an enemy for them. Um, but even though it's you know driving a lot of their sales, so it's a strange relationship. What do you think the likelihood is of uh, of uh, Samsung switching to their own OS. They they'll, they won't switch to their own OS, uh, but they, they 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 will build their own app layer on top of Android, and and they're doing that. Uh, what about Microsoft? Just you know, giving them a billion dollars to make Windows phones. Do you think they'll do that? I I think they'll do it if Microsoft pay them. They won't care. They just make phones. I mean. I, I think Samsung are, uh, you know, um, different to Apple, but uh, in one respect, they're the same, which is a lot of their revenue comes from selling hardware. And uh, if, if, if they get paid, you know, they get paid and they'll do it. Uh, they'll do anything for money. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They make refrigerators for other, other brands like Kenmore or Aman. I don't know who they make it for, but they, you know, they OEM a lot of stuff. They could easily OEM or make uh, Windows phones that are branded Samsung. Yeah, they do, they definitely don't like being dependent on Google, and I think that's partly a Korean thing. Um, you know, there's a very strong Korean national instinct to to not be dependent on, especially on an American company. And um, whenever you travel to Korea, I don't know. I've always had competitors in Korea, and I could never, never persuade them to partner because of that. And um, in, in in everything I ever did there, whereas. In China, you can. I mean, Chinese people are really flexible, and it's all about money. In Korea, there's always an element of the need to be independent that trumps money sometimes. I'm just desperately trying to suppress a joke about uncles right now. <laughs> Why suppress it? This is this is entertainment. <laughs> You're anonymous. You just go. Yeah, I know. I'm, <laughs> it's not not anonymous enough. <laughs> By the way, before we leave it behind, um, uh, as one does on travel, I'm reading a lot, and there's this great book uh, called Dogfight that I put into the uh, chat room, which uh, Fred Vogelstein has just published. It's how Apple and Google went to war and started a revolution. And for, for us, there maybe aren't too many revelations, except it really drills down into Scott Forstall's uh, life at Apple and what happened there. Uh, and it's it's a great book. Well, at the risk of cherry picking, what what happened? Uh, what happened is that basically he was a nobody. Who, um, when Steve got sick, he got a little bit sick as well, and Steve kind of helped him recover. And uh, somehow Steve promoted him into the exec meetings, just at the point they were talking about doing the iPhone, uh, having made a friendship with him. And uh, he basically leveraged his presence in that meeting to fork the iPhone effort. In, uh, and his effort was um, the one in which OS X was the operating system for the iPhone. The, the, the core effort run by another guy called Fidel, who's the guy who does Nest, was, was using the iPod operating system uh, for a phone. And uh, it, it kind of charts... Forstall's rise to success through that effort uh, and then makes the point that uh, in, in a lot of detail how he had two attributes that made him hated. The first was he took credit for work of his team um, and secondly he blamed his team for mistakes that he actually made himself. So he made himself a pariah in his own team over a number of years um, and it, you know, basically when he got the shaft it was everyone cheered. Hmm. Dan, anything, yes. anything yeah. uh, interesting to you about what's going on in uh, Washington? What did you think of the uh, the budget deal? That came out of nowhere, didn't it? It did, but I think maybe finally at the end of the year they're waking up to the fact that everybody hates them because they don't do anything that makes any common sense. So perhaps this was a you know the start of beginning new and Boehner's anger at all the. Uh, Tea party, um, the the Tea Party people, and you know, pissing on the deal. You know that that's definitely a good sign. But you know, there's still this. 
you know, it's still hard to recover, uh, but it, it is a good sign. The the whole NSA thing obviously has bubbled up quite a bit, and uh, I thought it was interesting that Time chose the Pope rather than Edward Snowden uh, to be their Person of the Year. What you surprised by that? I wasn't surprised. I thought it was the common sense. You know, it's much less controversial, but they like controversy. Um, but well, I don't think I, I think this was a case where Time didn't. Oh, want necessary to make a political statement uh, about spies and, and uh, you, you dropped that, your uh, microphone. Yes, the the fact that you know governments uh, you know tend to overreach. Um, what was interesting today is that um, I think there's a piece coming on 60 Minutes where you know the person who was looking into the NSA leaks is saying you know that you know maybe we should reach a deal with uh, with Snowden. And the deal would be is, you know, we'll be nice if you give us back the rest of the documents and don't publish anything else. Mm. And then General Alexander, who runs the NSA, says, well, you know, that's like saying, okay, well, you're holding us hostage, you shot 10 hostages, but you're going to give us the rest of them back. That That's just not going to fly. Yeah, it's interesting. I saw this discussion about... Um who should be the time man of the year and of course they chose the Putney Pope uh, but the, there was a lot of uh, belief that they should have chosen Snowden um, and, and tried to you know basically a bottoms up rehabilitation uh, it's this whole Snowden's a patriot kind of meme um, and uh, he represents a true America which isn't prepared to do all that stuff uh, as, a, as an attempt to me- turn him into a hero basically he's a Russian patriot now isn't he not really. I, he doesn't say nice things about Russia when he's quoted. I mean, he's, isn't he um, working for Russia? He's he working can't... in some. He's got some lowly IT job in a school or something. <laughs> that's what they say. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what yeah. happens when you go to Russia. You end up being a school janitor. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the only jobs they have, right? Let's exactly. hope he's now. I'm in trouble with the Koreans. I'm in trouble with the Russians. Yeah. No, but I. I you know, I think Talk. you know the, the, when when history is written, this this is going to go down as one of those real seminal moments. Uh, I don't think there'll be any long lasting impact. I think people will still spy and they'll do it covertly because that's just how, again, you know, we're back to human nature. And uh, but like the Pentagon Papers, you know, it reveals something. And the question now is, you know, whether people really care enough to do something about it or to make something happen about it and uh well it's an opportunity it's an opportunity for the uh you know the large uh players to actually have to confront what their strategy and what their public posture is regarding ethics uh, so well, their public there's their something public valuable posture, out of that i think true but their public posture is pretty limited they just say well you know they've overreached um they should be spanked and they should be do some reforms. Okay, well, I guess that's as far as they're going to get. Well, I mean, they've been, you know, legally enjoined from saying anything. So the fact that they are, you know, saying anything at all is interesting. Well, I think they're asking for reforms. The question is what specific kinds of reforms would they suggest? Um, And then it's also on Obama's watch, too, which is... uh, he has seemed to go along with all this. As you recall, he would have a press conference. He would say, "Look, we don't. I don't. We don't think. I don't think anything's wrong. But if American people think something wrong, then maybe we need to take a closer look." So there's really two two kind of very diametrically opposed views. There's one view that says that we have to do everything possible, including spying on Americans, you know, as you know, something that's caught in the crossfire, to protect ourselves from any terrorist attacks or industrial spying or whatever else it might be. And then on the other side, it's like, well, you know, it's invading our privacy, the Fourth Amendment, et cetera, et cetera, and they shouldn't be doing any of that. Um, uh, Obviously, it's going to be some, it lands somewhere in between. The question is that it's very unclear, there's very little transparency, whatever that means, and that uh, what the in-between is needs to be more clearly defined. Well, you know, it's an interesting dilemma. As a a non-American living in America and over 
15 years observing Americans' attitude to the state. Um, I still don't fully understand it, but I observe two contradictory trends. The first is an absolute hatred of the big state when it comes to spending money on people, you know, the welfare of people, whether it's education or health or whatever, contrasted with an absolute love of the big state when it comes to uh, America's place in the world and protecting us from outsiders, uh, where almost unlimited amounts of money can be spent uh, quite fairly irrationally uh, against threats that are not even very real. Uh, so so I, I, I get confused over debates like this because the people who don't want the state saving people's lives who are sick or do want the state you know, taking people's lives who are not real threats. Um, and, and, and I can't really empathize with it at all, so I just find myself being a kind of a clueless observer. John Tajak, any comments? I'm a clueless observer also. And how's that going for you? <laughs> it's going better than the uh, my my informed ignorance about uh, European football. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can't talk about football. My team, Manchester United, is had, having such a bad season that. Um, Do you know why? It's because they import talent. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that doesn't work, as the Yankees have proved. You know, that's a big debate. I, I hate that debate, but it's like, you know, the reason that English soccer players suck is because foreigners get in the teams. And that's yes, we had, not right. It's the other it's, way around. The reason totally, foreigners get totally in the It's totally right. It's completely you know, the, right. I do it the other way around. It's the reason, the reason foreigners get in the teams is because English players suck. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. But, <laughs> okay, yeah. well... I find it comical that you calling that football, but that's just me. Yeah. Football yeah. is something that's played on Sunday, and uh, there's a lot of alcohol involved. That's about it. It's also played on Thursday, Saturday, yeah, Sunday, I know. And and Monday. Since TV got into it. <laughs> so, but, uh, but the other football, which is uh, you know more global is played on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and sometimes Sundays. So at the risk of interrupting this fascinating conversation, uh, the, uh, uh, I'm going to I was going to give you, I was going to throw you a bone, Steve. Because so, another big thing for me this week is reading that one third of Yahoo's revenue comes from Microsoft search deal. That, I, I was staggered it was that high. Really? Why would you? I mean, Steve Ballmer had his foot on Yahoo's neck uh, and they never let up. I mean, didn't they have to buy the, their way out of being crushed by uh, giving Microsoft uh, that that leverage? Oh, you I know, mean, it's that, a lot like the NSA. It's like, what? I'm shocked. Yeah, but a th I, did you know it was that big a percentage? Well, I mean, that, that means off? that. Didn't they sell their advertising or, or revenue to Microsoft directly? Dan, do you remember uh, any of this? They, yeah, they, they uh, you know, Bing, Bing is the search engine for Yahoo, so there's a uh, revenue share with Microsoft uh, over that. And I think in the last quarter, the last several quarters, in fact, I think the last quarter, search revenue accounted for more than display advertising revenue. So search is really critical to Yahoo. They make a ton of money on search, but you know, now the question gets to be is okay, well well what are they are you know, are they gonna end up with Bing or how are they going to make their search more compelling, especially in the face of Google? And having talked to some of their search people, their their strategy is is all around uh, context, uh, which is you know, the search engine can crawl and find lots of raw materials and uh, add relevance and ranking to all of that. But then the, the next step would be is, okay, well, what do I know about each user and how can I deliver results that are more relevant to them based on what I know about them, uh, based on the context, like where they are, um, what they've been reading, you know, what they like, what their interests are. And Yahoo, I think, seems to think they have lots of data about their users, given that they have about 800 million users, uh, about... 300 million use their mail engine, which has had a lot of problems this week. 
um, so they could read through your mails, your calendars, you know, that they have a lot of usage on finance, sports, entertainment, their homepage probably gets about 40 million people a day. So, yeah, they, they could make more relevant search results for people on top of what, of what a Bing does with a, you know, with a nice user interface, which is a big focus for Yahoo right now. End of speech. What do you guys think of uh, Google caching all the images uh, that uh, at, uh, direct marketers um, would potentially use for getting some of that context out? Have you thought about what that means? So you know, it's like in, it's mainly in Gmail where you have to you have to click the button to display images, and those images give you some kind of content. Well, one of the things I read about that was is that don't worry. Uh, marketers will still be able to tell uh, when those pictures are opened. I'm not sure how that would work, but uh, wouldn't that be the the main impact that would cause consternation? Well, I think that the marketers, uh, you know, not seeing some kind of content of people who are not interested in those messages is um, is not that bad. Um, you know, they don't, they get some. They don't get the information they didn't have before, uh, but I think what it sets Google up as is a way for them to be a resource, a data resource, a repository for marketers back who don't have access to that that pipe. I, I'm not sure exactly. It's not really clear. I'm just wondering myself. It's uh, it, it's it's interesting though that email is that channel. It's interesting to me whether uh, the implication was that Google did this on purpose to make uh, doing deals with those marketers less attractive, thus making spending money with Google more attractive. But I doubt that that's true. I, I, it feels to me more likely someone on the mail team thought it would be a better user experience to not have to wait to get the pictures. Um, but maybe I'm being naive. But I think that's, that's definitely true. Uh, you, know, you don't know what to click, not to click. Now, they can, now you can just, it's just there. And it's already vetted. I think that's a smart thing for Google to do. Um, the The problem is that, you know, for people who are using the you know embedded links and images to figure out what you know where people are, locations, and things like that, I think that's just a uh, maybe that's collateral. But it also is an opportunity for Google to tap into a market for data data selling. Right, and you know have. Uh with all those clicks that would then, you know, clicking on the image would take you somewhere. Uh, Google would be able to track you off of its uh, servers and into uh, cyberspace. That's Although, I mean, in the big picture, uh, re reading the, the Fred Vogelstein book, there's another interesting d kind of subtext, which is the fear of the move from the desktop to mobile as it pertains to search advertising in general. And the reason that uh, Google initially embraced the iPhone was because it had a full browser and their search ads still showed up. Um, but rolling the clock forward, uh, that was 2006, six seven. rolling the clock forward <coughs> six years, it seems pretty clear that people do not do that many searches on mobile, at least compared to what we did when we were glued to a desktop the whole time. And it's got to be the case that search advertising in general is going to, over time, become a less and less interesting business. Yeah, and re what it, replaced, so what by, it, uh, replaced by predictive uh, serving of information. You don't yeah, have to search I, for something sure if it true. shows up. I don't, I don't know if that's true. If there's fewer searches, there's fewer similar searches. Like you're not going through, and although I still do this, uh, you're not going through and looking up the same words that you would type into Chrome search bar. But there's just as many searches, if not more, on different things like maps, restaurants, when you're inside a map, things that are you know, related yeah. to where you are. I think there's a maps, lot more yeah. of those. Yeah, I think maps is huge, al al although under-monetized today. Um, uh, you know, there's still, if you, I mean, imagine, John, if we were running monetization at Google, uh, I think you're right. That would be a major effort to figure out maps monetization, but there'd also be the kind of absolute certainty that the revenue that we got today. Probably 
Uh, I think the authorities just got to him. Yep. Yank, they yanked his, yanked his <laughs> privileges. <Yeah. laughs> He'll turn up six years you know, from now in, in North Korea. With a beard hope- like yours. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, I, I'm going to try calling him back. But in the meantime, why don't we start with Dan and see if we can uh, uh, put a bow on this tie or whatever. Yes. Well, uh, I wish everybody a good holiday and uh, that we can uh, stop down from thinking about all these super important technology company and product issues and uh, do some mindful things. Ooh, mindfulness. I'm, I'm in favor of that. But thanks for throwing us under the bus. Uh, <laughs> we talked about China and healthcare. I mean, th- those are important know, non-technology was, I, things. You know, I... Unfortunately, the chat room didn't seem to be enraged by it, which uh, is a help, helpful or mindful sign. Um, and we should do a show on mindfulness as well, now that I'm a rank amateur at it. Uh, to bring in some special guests. Uh, and and, who, and would say, that mm-hmm. Buddha, uh, who would that be? No, I'm not sure. You're the booker. No, I'm not. Tina. Okay. Oh, wait. Here's Keith coming back to say goodbye. Hang on one second. And the winner is... Hey. So they got to you, huh? <laughs> You're, why are you in a different room? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this guy off to my left with a gun. <laughs> So we're 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 kind of to wrap up, and uh, Dan Farber is suggesting that we get mindful uh, for the holidays and stop talking about technology. I I wasn't suggesting that. I think you can do both at the same time. Mindful technology. Exactly. You'll be reading a lot about that in the future. I think you will. Yeah. Any comment, Keith? Or, or? Uh, so, so what I heard is mindful, M-I-N-E, and uh, my brain immediately uh, went to Bitcoins, which is a discussion we haven't had at any length, but I've learned a lot about Bitcoins on this tra- trip. Maybe next time we can talk well, about give us what's a preview. going on there. They're banned there, aren't they? No, in fact, the opposite. Uh, but they're, they're banned for certain things. You can't use them in retail. But you, but they're uh, actually flourishing otherwise uh, as a means of as a store of value and as a means of exchange. It's the biggest in the world. I think about seventy to eighty percent of all Bitcoin transactions are happening on the China exchange. But I um, thought that the banks were uh, prevented from using or uh, doing anything with Bitcoins. Well, uh, another maybe that's for another show. I don't know. It's a long. It's a long topic. They're prevented from doing certain things, um, but it's all about retail. Uh, they're not, in general, the Chinese government's taking the same opinion as the American government, which is this might be interesting. And the context within which it gets interesting is it, uh, um, when you think about reserve currencies, and if you look at the last century as we move from the pound, then to the gold standard, and then to the Bretton Woods Agreement, and then to the dollar, um, as, as China grows relative to the rest of the world, you know, the underlying expectation is that you're uh, at some point in the future going to need a different reserve currency. And, uh, and the Chinese definitely don't want to be the world's banker. They, they have no ambitions to play the role of the dollar. But because their currency is used more and more in trade, and, and by the way, they just floated it. Uh, um, in terms of interest rates, even more than it was floated before. So the market playing a bigger and bigger role there. Um, and then there's this new kind of, uh, they just had their five-year plan thing, and uh, basically what came out of it was accelerating liberalization, including, I met with a government official in Guangzhou, uh, I had it with me, but card actually had a hammer and sickle on it. <laughs> um, and and um, he, he even used the word democracy. That the, uh, there will ultimately be quote democracy, whatever that means in the Chinese context. So there's this kind of overall kind of sense that the world's changing, that China's going to be the biggest player, and Bitcoin, 
comes into view as a possible store of value, a little bit like the gold standard was, but without needing gold. And that, that's a real conversation. There's lots of research papers about it from really respected people. All right. And uh, John Tashek, you want to talk about Bitcoins? No. Um, mindfulness? No. Um, I don't know. I forgot what we talked about today, but uh, I think uh, I think it was a slow week. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> time, time to wrap it up. <laughs> well, the, you know what? The good thing was we didn't talk about Twitter blocking, uh, changing the block functionality and then reversing That's right. it. Yeah, well, Twitter block and unblock. Uh, well, I'm just waiting for Dave Weiner to jump in on that one. But I can't see him, so because he blocked me years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Did okay. you get access for a brief moment there when they the unblocked? I don't know. I was asleep at the time. I think. <laughs> it only lasted a little while. Yeah. Well, I only sleep a little while. But it was then. Even if I'm not telling the truth. All right. Um, I want to thank uh, Rackspace and particularly Rob Lejess, without which we would not be here. Uh, I want to thank uh, New Tech and uh, their fabulous TriCaster, which is even more fabulous in the immediate future now that we're going to have a few days uh, of uh, post-Dreamforce uh, slowdown so that we'll be able to get this thing up and running. Uh, we're very excited about that and some other things as well. Uh, I want to thank our producer and director, Tina Chase Gilmore, and uh, I want to thank John Tashek. <laughs> <laughs> what was the, uh, the how'd you introduce me? The uh, Fortress of Ineptitude? Well, no, I no, you quite said well. that. <laughs> I said the Fortress of. Uh, well, luckily, we'll be able turpitude. to. Turpitude? <laughs> <laughs> uh, fortress of Moral Turpitude. Um, I want to thank uh, in China, Keith Tier. This worked out quite well. For you guys, yeah. My, my alarm went for 4.45 a.m. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go and swim in the South China Sea as soon as this is over just to wake up. Is that safe? It's beautiful, actually. I'm, it's, the water is just cold enough to feel refreshed, but quite warm. And uh, cut to shot of Dan Farber's library. Thanks, Dan. As always, we appreciate it. Uh, what library? If given that he said he's in a place called Occidental, what is that library? It can't be his library. Yeah, it is. He's got. Oh, well, here he is. He can answer that question. Dan, do you live in? Dan, is Occidental a place you have a, a home? Yes. And those are books behind you. Yeah, those are books. <laughs> Your <laughs> those are books. See, if you and, stick around long enough, you really get some gems. <laughs> there's got to be yeah. a good. There's got to be a good story behind how a town gets to be called Occidental. It was completely Occidental. It was very Occidental. <laughs> it was Occidental. Okay, uh, well. I, I had to leave a little bit because I had to put a log on the fire. It's getting cold. All right. Well, you you can go back to your but mindful I, log I, rolling. You know, it, you know, it's kind of a sign of the times that Twitter you know, puts out a feature from you know, without, you know, without getting probably enough user feedback. And then the next day they uh, put it back to the way it was before. So I guess they are listening, just not soon <laughs> enough. I don't see how you can say that they're listening. Not soon enough. They start, no, they start by not listening. And then. And then they listen and, and then, then react they react to the silence. Of right, not right. listening, and then they do something. I think well, you know, just, it's, you know, they're they're fighting the tyranny of the masses. I mean, that's that's really tough. Yeah. Well, it's also who do you listen to? Because almost every point of view you could have probably exists, and it's who's screaming the loudest at any given moment. It was a PR disaster, basically, that I had to recover from. But if you look at the actual change. Um, I was a surprised they didn't stick to their guns because the actual change wasn't that illogical or irrational it it it, it 
it was different, and they could have they could have fixed some of the concerns with it as well. But anyway, maybe they'll still do that. If only they had a news feed where they could look at information that was flowing across their bus. Yeah, it would help. Hmm. Let's elect a delegation to <laughs> run that up <laughs> Costello's flagpole. <laughs> Pardon the expression. Okay. <laughs> I'll, uh, we were thanking everybody, and I'm thanking you now, Dan, in person for... Uh, well, thank you. I apologize for being absent from it, school. It's all right. It led to some moments of mindful comedy. Uh, okay. Thanks to everybody who showed up. Oh, but I got some feedback from people in the uh, chat room about my famous or infamous sign-off about thanks to everybody who showed up, and especially those who didn't. Uh, Amy Lou seemed to think that I was talking about her. I'm not. I'm not talking about anybody who's in the chat room. I'm talking about one or Me. two individuals. No, no. <laughs> it's very specific, and if you've followed the show for the last 25 years, uh, you can figure out who I'm talking about. Uh, but the good news is, is they are not watching, and they're not listening, just like they weren't at the time. So <laughs> it'll be... It'll be good. But uh, thanks to everybody who showed up, and especially those who didn't. We'll see you. Oh, happy birthday to our 20-year-old daughter, Naomi, who she's no longer a teenager, just in time for her younger sister to become a teenager. So we didn't get any time off. <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday to her. Yes. and Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a great ride. It beats everything. We'll see you again next time. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs>